Well, it's good to see you tonight. Hope you had a great day. Uh, a couple of things I want to share with you. We'll be back in service this Sunday. All the services will be available. Uh, how many felt like you had two Mondays this week? You had a Monday and then you had today that seemed like Monday, or that's the way it felt with me. Well, let's pray. If you have an offering, they'll take that up. We're going to get into the Bible study tonight. We're in Exodus chapter 13. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing grace, your love, your compassion for us. Lord, we thank you for all of your many blessings, and Lord, those who give, bless both gift and giver tonight. Lord, bless your word as we read and study. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Gen uh, Exodus chapter 13. That's where we're going to start. Very interesting lesson tonight. Uh, verse 1, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. So he's going to tell a little bit more about the Passover here, and he's going to give the reason why he has what we would call the firstborn. Verse 3, Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand of the, of hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. On this day you are going out in the month of Abib. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give to you a land flowing with milk and honey. You shall keep this service in this month. So two things he says. Number one, the first is mine. So this is an indication of the law of first fruits. We're going to see that in different uh, aspects of the law of Moses when it's given. And then he says, remember this day, and the day is Passover. So last time we gathered, we talked about the Passover. They were to take a lamb of the first year, male, without spot, without blemish. They were to uh, kill that lamb and mark their door with the blood. And we spent a lot of time talking about that is indicative and forelooking uh, about Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God. And the only way that you, you were saved in that house, if you were the firstborn, was by the blood. And how many of you know today we're saved by the blood? You know, it's, it's not church that saves you. It's not denominations that saves you. It's not the preacher, the pastor. It's Jesus and what he did at the cross, shedding his blood. So he said, this is Passover. Verses 6 through 10, he said, seven days you shall eat the unleavened bread. On the seventh day it shall be a feast for you. And he's talking about the Passover feast. He said, tell your son, this is done because of what the Lord did for us or me. When we came up from Egypt, it, talking about the Passover, will be a sign and a memorial for you in its season from year to year. Uh, this question was asked, uh, I heard it today, why don't we continue to keep the Passover? Well, uh, one of the reasons we don't continue to keep the Passover as they did, Jesus in some way elevated the Passover when he took Passover with his disciples before he was arrested, before he was crucified in that uh, that uh, weekend where he rose from the dead on the third day. So if you remember, he, he took the bread, and they were at Passover, and he passed it to those disciples. He said, take and eat. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And then he said, take and drink. He said, this is uh, uh, the blood that I'm going to shed. It's indicative of the blood. And so as they drank the wine, ate the bread, he said, this is my body, this is my blood. Now, in years before, they did eat the body and they did apply the blood, but it was of the Passover lamb. So Jesus is the true Passover lamb. So in some way, every time we take communion, we're celebrating in a type Passover. Now they did it once a year in the spring, in the month of Abid, as we read there. But in some way, we are continuing that um, um, that remarkable remembrance of what was done, getting them out of bondage. But today we're not out of bondage from Egypt, we're out of the bondage of sin. And it took the Lamb, just as it took them to get out of Egypt, their bondage, it took 
Jesus, the Passover lamb, for us to get out of our bondage. So that's uh, in some way uh, uh, an answer to that question. Uh, one of the ways that we don't want to get caught up in, or one of the things we don't want to get caught up in, is to go back and think we have to keep feasts and festivals of the Jewish or, or, uh, origin or traditions. Um, I guess there's nothing wrong with doing that, but how many of you know that doesn't save you? I mean, you can go back and you do all those uh, you know, feasts and festivals, and you, you can get back into circumcision, and matter of fact, you, you're putting it in reverse, <laughs> Because he has freed us from those ordinances, and so we are freed by Christ and not by the traditions that was given to them under the old covenant. And that's a good thing. Would you agree with me on that? Look at verse 11. It shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and he gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with the lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons shall you redeem. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? And let me stop there. They're going to say, Dad, why are we doing this? Would that be a good line? Why are we doing this? I mean, why are we, you know, eating, you know, crackers for a week, flat bread? Why are we having a feast at the end of the seventh day? Why are we having to redeem the first animal, the firstborn of everything that we have? And he said, you shall say to him, by the strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And he goes on to explain here, that that last plague, the death of the firstborn, is what released them. So look with me at verse 15. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting this go. So this is a father still giving this to a son. When Pharaoh was stubborn about letting this go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrificed to the Lord all the males that opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be a sign upon your hand and as frontless between your eyes, for by the strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So he says, what I'm doing, son, when you were born, if you were the firstborn, I took a sacrifice to the altar to redeem you as my firstborn. And those firstborn animals, whether you know, it was a, a calf, a sheep, a, a, an oxen, whatever, then they would give that, sacrifice that to the Lord. And it brought them back. Every time they did that, they remembered the firstborn died in Egypt to let them go free. So he brings them back to that moment, time after time after time after time. Here's a line we've all heard. If we don't remember history, what are we going to do? We're going to repeat it. So in the Jewish culture, in their nation, he said, I want you to do this generation after generation after generation after generation so you will know why we do what we do and what got us out of Egypt from the land of bondage. Here's something interesting. This is true about a church. It's usually true about a business. It's usually true about a family. And not, not always 100%, but it is amazingly accurate. If someone builds a company, they, they have a ranch, they have a farm, they have a career, um, they, they, they build an entrepreneurial you know, type business, then it took a lot of sacrifice for that to happen. Then the next generation that comes along they saw the sacrifice that was paid and participated in what was, you know, the, the company, the corporation, the ranch, the farm, family business, or whatever. But when the third generation comes along, they're the ones who most likely lose it. And let me tell you why. Number one, they weren't there to see the price that was paid for it. They didn't see the sacrifice that was given for it. And they don't value it as much as the other two generations. 
So this is something that's pretty problematic and common with a whole lot of uh, people, families, companies, corporations. Uh, I have some land that I've been leasing, you know, for decades. So it is in the third generation now. And let me tell you what they're doing with it. They're selling it. Because the third generation wants the money. They, they don't want to keep on to the land. It means nothing for them. So I, I'm dealing with a lot of third generation uh, families now in the agricultural business. Um, very few people want to work as hard <laughs> as we work. Uh, don't blame them because you can go do other things and make a lot more money. And most of you know that. However, when you've seen the price that was paid and you were a part of that, then it's hard to see that go and be let go because of what you saw that happened to get it where it was. Um, you know, someone asked me, well, you know, are y'all going to keep this land or whatever? I said, as long as my father lives, I will not sell any of it. I mean, I mean you know, there, there's certain things. You may have a wedge here or something like that, but... You know, it's hard to, when, when you've built something all of your life, it's hard to see something go. Does that make sense? So here the Lord says, you need to be very exact about telling your children, generation after generation after generation, this is what this means. This is what was paid for the price for us to get out of Egypt. And they were very good about passing that on from generation to generation. If you look at some of the words here, it says that, you know, you shall uh, put it as a sign on your hand and frontless between your eyes. There's a term, kind of a weird name, a phylactery, uh, a PH. And the Jewish custom was that they would take about three or four verses out of the Word of God and they would put it in a box, and they would strap it by leather or cloth right in the forehead between their eyes, or they would bind it on their arm. And so they would have the word literally between their eyes, on their forehead, and around there. It was, it was kind of a ceremonial thing. They didn't always do it, but they, they did it many times. And so it was a, a type of not letting that word slip. It was, you know, it's going to be there over and over and over again. Verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, though that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God let the people, led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. So the quickest way to get to Canaan was to go up along the coast of the Mediterranean. And you had to go, by the way, the Philistines here. That's where they live. Has anyone ever heard in the news the Gaza Strip? Okay. So that's kind of the region along the, uh, the, uh, the east side of the, the Mediterranean, which would be the west coast of Palestine and uh, Philistia. There is an area there that they would be brought to later, and it's called Kadesh Barnea, and it was the bottom of that area, and that's where they would enter in the promised land, and that's where Moses sent the spies. But the first thing that they saw was the very thing that the Lord was afraid they would see and turn back to Egypt. So he put some space between that time, but even when it was time for them to go, they still did not go because of fear. So he's going to take them, and he's going to circumvent and take them around. And, of course, uh, if they had uh, listened to the Lord and done what they should have done, they could have been there in weeks. It only took them 40 years when they could have been there in weeks. Have you ever thought, well, the Lord's taken me the long way around? This term I use every once in a while. Uh, sometimes I felt like the door, the, the door didn't open for me. The Lord just pulled me through the keyhole. <laughs> you ever feel like that? So he, he says, okay, th th they're, they're going to go a different way, not the obvious way. And now they're leaving uh, Egypt, and they're headed to the promised land. Verse 19, this is interesting. 
Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So think about this. About 430 years before, 430 years before, this man by the name of Joseph, by believing the word of God that was spoken to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which would have been his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, where the Lord said, I'm going to give you this land. And now he's in Egypt, but he knows God is going to keep his promise. Sometimes we don't think about the time frame, but how many of you know God's still going to keep his promise? And he said, so when you go, he said, you take my bones with you. Now, the word bones there may be a little deceiving because we do know, if you go back and read the book of Genesis, when Joseph died, they buried him in the custom of the Egyptians according to the word of God. So the custom of the Egyptians is what? They mummified his body. So now we have Joseph, and we we did some video and some pictures uh, when we did the Genesis, Genesis study that they actually believed that there was an area that Joseph lived in And there was, if you will, a mausoleum where they buried Joseph. And so Moses, the children of Israel, when they leave, uh, they take the mummified body of Joseph with them, and they head out of Egypt. That's interesting, isn't it? Verse 20, so they took their journey from Succoth, camped at Etham, at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So here's a good question. Why did he um, continue to have the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night? It's some conjecture, but that first few days that they left Egypt, I'm thinking they probably traveled some by night. And let me tell you why. The Sinai Peninsula, where they were traveling, is actually under Egyptian rule. So even though it's, we don't look at it as Egyptian um, proper, Egypt proper, but that peninsula is actually controlled by the Egyptians. It actually gives Egypt a buffer zone. It's very rugged, desolate, desert, um, the other countries around them, you take the Philistines, the Moabites, Ammonites, uh, you know, all these countries around, that actually gave Egypt a little buffer zone there. And this is the area they're actually traveling into. So I would think they're trying to get as far away from the Egyptians as quickly as they can because of what has happened in the past. Pharaoh may come after him. We're going to read here in a minute that he he is going to come after him. So they're trying to put as much distance between them and the Egyptians. So I'm guessing they're probably doing some traveling by night. Now, I have a question here that I wrote down for myself. How long did the Lord lead them by the pillar of cloud and fire? So in the the first five books of Moses, it doesn't give us, give us an, a really an exact time, but I think we can ascertain a, an exact time from other passages. So just jot down if your notes, if you're taking notes tonight, Nehemiah chapter 19 through 21. So this is uh, the time of Nehemiah, the leaders of Israel, they've come back home. Now they're reading the word of God and the law to people who have not heard it very much in 70 years because they've been in Babylonian captivity for about 70 years. So this is what is shared with Israel. Yet in your manifold mercies, talking about the mercies of God, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. A pillar of cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way that they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Isn't that amazing? 
Listen, I hadn't been in the wilderness, and sometimes my feet swell. And sometimes my clothes wear out. But this is a miraculous journey. The Bible says that their, their feet did not swell, their shoes did not wear out, their clothes did not wear out. So for 40 years, they never had to go to Dillard's or Belk's or uh, Kohl's or any of those places. But that scripture in some way indicates that that pillar of cloud and fire was with them the entire journey. Now we do know from reading Deuteronomy that the presence of the Lord was present all the way up until the time that Moses died. So Moses died right before they crossed the Jordan River in the Promised Land. And the reason if you remember him uh, going to the rock to get water out, uh, you know, the first time he was to smite the rock. The second time he was to do what? Speak to the rock. Now, Paul gives us an indication of that, actually in the book of Corinthians, where he says that rock was Christ. And how many times was Christ supposed to be smitten? Only once. And Moses had smitten the rock twice. And the Lord was angry with Moses because he smote the rock instead of speaking to the rock. And he said, because of that, he said, you will not be allowed to go to the promised land. So he died right before they crossed over. And we know the presence, the, the Shekinah, if you will, the glory of God was there even in the day of Moses. So we, we assume that that is correct. And, and let me t tell you another assumption and, and this is, I think, pretty good conjecture. We know the manna did not cease until they entered the promised land. So for 40 years, God had the manna come down from heaven every day except the Sabbath. But once they crossed over to the promised land, the manna ceased. Now why? God got them to their destination. Isn't it good God can get you to where he's trying to get you to? So, so you need to be encouraged tonight. On the way, there's going to be a lot of difficulty. But he's still going to be with you. He's still going to provide for you till he gets you where you need to be. I tell you what, that just makes me want to shout. <laughs> he's going to get us there, right? So here is some of the words here in this, um, this thought about the, the glory of the Lord. There's a Hebrew word by the name of kavod, spelled K-A-B-O-D, which means the glory of Jehovah. It's sometimes we call it the Shekinah. M many of you have heard the word Shekinah, which is the glory, divine presence of the Lord. And in some way, it's similar to the cloud. So we know that the cloud represented the presence of the Lord. Now, how do we know that? Well, one of the ways we know that is when Solomon dedicated the temple... We know that the cloud came down in the temple so strong that the priest could not even stand to uh, you know, minister before the Lord because of the, the presence of God. Now, how many would agree with me? We need the presence of God. But, you know, as uh, human nature can be, if we drift away from the ways of God, if we don't really esteem God, if we live sinful lives, if we live in iniquity, uh, there, is a, there is a term that is given in the book of uh, Samuel called Ichabod. And the word Ichabod means the glory of the Lord has departed. And the last time that we see the glory of the Lord or the cloud or the presence of God in the temple or around the ark is actually found in Ezekiel chapter 10. This is very interesting. Israel had got to the place that they had so corrupted themselves and so transgressed God by worshiping idols and images that the presence of God literally left the temple. This is Ezekiel 10, 18. When the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple, and I have a question here, where did it go? The Bible tells us, it went out the east gate. The glory of the Lord 
literally lifted off the temple, out of the temple, went across the threshold with the cherubim, and it says that, and they went out the east gate. Now, now why is this interesting to me? I, you know, I, I give you information overload here because it's interesting to me. So why didn't the glory of the Lord just go straight up? Why didn't it go out another gate? Why didn't it go out the Damascus gate or the Dung gate or the Water gate or, you know, whatever other gate? It's interesting to me that Ezekiel chapter 10 says the presence of God, the glory of God went out the east gate. It's also very interesting to me that when Jesus has his triumphal entry, guess what gate he came back into? He came back into the east gate. So at their height of corruption, when the presence of God went out that gate, hundreds of years later, the presence of God came back in that gate. And that was Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, Son of God. So the presence of God left that gate. The presence of God through Jesus Christ came back in that gate. Here's another little parallel. Where did Jesus ascend to heaven from? The Mount of Olives. Where is he going to plant his feet again when he returns? The Mount of Olives. The glory of the Lord went out the east gate. The glory of the Lord came back in the east gate. Jesus left the Mount of Olives, ascended to heaven. When he comes back, guess where he's going to land? Same place where he departed from. Anyway, that didn't cost you anything extra. <laughs> Exodus chapter 14. So now we're shifting gears. We're going to the, the chapter where we have the parting of the Red Sea. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel as they turn and camp before Pi-Hatheroth between Migdal and the sea opposite Belzephron. You shall camp before it by the sea, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land, and the wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. So I'm fixing to show you a couple of maps here. So these are maps... Uh, of the area of Egypt. So they lived in the land of Goshen. They're going down through the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, if you were 100 or 50 years ago, you were told Mount Sinai is at the bottom of that uh, Sinai Peninsula. Uh, that was actually established pretty much by Constantine back when he was converted to Christianity. But most scholars today believe that is not actually the mount that Moses received the law on. And they do not think that this shallow area that we might say is the area of the Suez Canal is where they uh, crossed and they parted, uh, God parted the sea for them to go over. And you, you've always heard this, and I've heard this. Well, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal to go through there because it was shallow, it was the Reed Sea. And uh, obviously, none of what the Bible says could be accomplished in shallow water. I mean, it's hard to, you know, destroy Pharaoh's armies in three feet of water, right? So, so this is the area that most scholars today believe that they took as their journey. So we're going to leave that up there just for a second. Now, I want to go back to the scripture here, uh, 14 uh, verses 1 through 4. He said, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And we know that that happened time and time and time again. And now he says, I'm going to do it one more time. So we talked about a month ago about this area of um, divine election and how sometimes people have taken that really too far. The Bible says it's the Lord's will that everybody should be saved. But he knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. How, how you know, he, he's not only all-powerful, he's all, also all-knowing. But I personally believe the Lord gives everybody a chance for salvation. Now, what they do with that, that's between them and the Lord. But once they harden their heart, 
or they have no remedy left. Uh, in the Old Testament, um, you know, we talk about hardness of heart. In the New Testament, the Bible says he gave them over to a reprobate mind. So they, they kind of got to the point where they passed the days of grace that they had. So Pharaoh is going to have another time where he feels like he made a mistake. And his heart is, is hardened. And he's going to pursue them. And he's going to follow their route. And he's going to interdict them about the, the, the bottom right of that Sinai Peninsula. Because that's where they think those cities are. Now, if you look at the bottom there, that is the Gulf of Aqaba. And the left body of water is actually the Red Sea. Now, there are other places that scholars believe they, they crossed. The widest part of that body of water is about 15 miles. The place that that shows where they crossed would be about 8 miles. Um, the deepest part of that gulf is 6,070 feet. The average depth of that gulf is 2,624 feet. If you go to the, the, the Red Sea on the left, the maximum depth of the Red Sea is 9,974 feet. The reason I look these numbers up is because I want you to have a whole new look at the parting of the sea, whether it was red or the Gulf of Aqaba. So let, let's just take the average depth of that gulf on the right, where most scholars believe that they crossed, if that is one of the deeper parts, it's over one mile deep. If it's an average depth, it's about a half a mile deep. Okay, let, let me let your mind think about that just a little bit. So if you're crossing either sea, I think it's probably the Gulf of Aqaba, and the Lord's going to Part the waters. The wall of water on each side of you is a half a mile high. Are, are you rethinking this? It could possibly be a half a mile high. If it is in a deeper part, it is over one mile high. You have a wall of water around you that is very high wherever they crossed okay verse 5 now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people and they said why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us so he made ready his chariot took his people with him also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. So it wasn't just 600 chariots. It was 600 choice chariots. And then the rest of the chariots with the men and the captain, captains with them. And the Lord hardened his heart, hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pi-Hatheroth uh, Pi before bel Zephron. Now, if we put all this together, there are the 600 choice chariots. There are the other chariots, verse 9, with horses and chariots, with horsemen and his army. Did you put it all together? There's very elite chariots, there's average chariots, there's horsemen and armies with those two types of chariots, if you look at the scripture. Now the reason that they feel like they have a good place to interdict the children of Israel is because of where they're camped. Verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, 
Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. So we're going to put another map up here. We're going to go back to that map. So if you look at that area where they went up, looped, and came back down, it's hard to see the topography on that map, but from the coast back to the west is, is huge mountain and very rugged country. Along the edge of the coast, um, we think it's somewhere maybe 10 to 18 miles wide. You know, that what would be the path that you would uh, go through. So it's a little lighter in the green. If you look back up above the green, you see it darker, which means the, the elevation rises. So at this time, we think there's about 3 million people with them. We know there's over 600,000 men that are 21 years and older. And this is not counting the women and the children. So... Uh, um, and probably not counting the old men. So it talks about the men who were actually uh, of age for war. So it'd be, that would be about 21 years, 22 years and up. Have you ever wondered why we used to have, you, you couldn't register and be drafted until you were 21? It's pretty much a biblical year. Um, now it's down to 18, but uh, unless you're in Russia. So that's where they get trapped and they feel like they're fixed to be destroyed because they have nowhere to run. They have the sea on one side. Probably they're in a gorge or they're in an area where they, they can't move and mountains on the other side. Could there have been a few people escaped? Probably. Three million? Probably not. Because they're on foot. The army's chasing them with what? Horses, chariots, horse riders an army and these people are not warriors they've been slaves for 430 years so th they're not warriors Th they don't really have any weapons do they i mean that th th they're they're toast right let me give you some observations just in in these verses here so fear absolutely struck their heart it says they cried out to the lord then they said to moses so I, I put a few things there. Can you imagine what they were saying to Moses? Okay. And so when we're in fear and conflict, we often look for somebody to blame, and that's exactly what they did. Who are they blaming? Blaming Moses. You know, you brought us out here. It would have been better to be a slave than to die in the wilderness. That was their thoughts. So that, that's, that's what they believed. So I wrote down here in my notes, why do we think that when we run into difficulty that the Lord has abandoned his promises and his will for our own lives? Because Listen, this is what I know. I don't care where you go, what you do, you're going to have difficulty. I mean, you could have heard just as clearly from the Lord as a thunderous voice from heaven, uh, a burning bush experience like Moses, God meeting with Moses, and Moses knew exactly what he's supposed to do. You're supposed to lead these people out of Egypt, take them to the promised land. I mean, Moses knew that. There's not a doubt in his mind. And now they're here. They're trapped. They're, they're in a bad place. And now we're thinking, Lord, you made a mistake, and you led us the wrong direction. But you know what? If you follow the Lord, he's up to something. He's up to something. And, and I thought about this even with you know, the church here, um, you know, forgive me, I, I don't try to be ugly here. There's a lot of churches, they're not going anywhere. Just telling you, they're not, they're not going anywhere. They're going to keep doing the same old thing they've done for 100 years. That's not our mentality here. That's not our spirit here. We're going to continue to build. We're going to continue to grow. We're going to try to reach kids and people and teenagers and families i mean you know we're going to continue to do that so as we continue to do that are we going to reach obstacles and difficulties absolutely i mean i thought we would be 
having a metal building already up over here in the summer, ready for school to start in August. You say, well, what happened? Uh, we got trapped at the Red Sea. And a lot of it's just government. Um, you know, you've got to have approval. You, you've got to have everybody and their dog to stamp, you know, plans. And uh, so you say, well, you know, it would have been better for us not to even start it. Oh, no. Listen, you've got to keep moving. You, you quit moving, you die. I don't care if that's you, your family, or this church. We have to keep moving. And as we move, whatever obstacle that we face, God has to answer that obstacle. You say, why? Because we're moving in the direction he said go. Now, I want you to see something here. So when they think it's over, God's just getting ready to move. And he's going to move in a way that they have never, ever seen him move before. And the enemy has never, ever seen God move this way before. Verse 13, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. The opposite of faith is fear. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. I'm pretty convinced that Moses did not know what God was going to do when he said that. But he knew God was going to do something because I'm doing what he wants me to do. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So verse 14 is a lovely verse. He says, God's going to fight for you. Now shut up. Read it. The Lord's going to fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. So let, let's bring it up to 21st century. God's going to fight you, for you, and you need to shut your mouth right now. One of the things that gets us into trouble is our mouth runs over and over and over, and we get to where we're not speaking faith anymore. We're, fe we're, we're speaking doubt and fear. So... The Lord will fight for you, and you just need to shut up. So uh, we, we sanctified verse 14 before I said that, right? Verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? So now Moses is turning to God, and you can read maybe between the lines, God, what are we going to do here? And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. You say, w wait a minute, go forward. We, we can't go forward. There's a sea in front of us. No, you go forward. You see, you, you got to obey God by going forward sometimes before God actually moves. Now, we don't have the details here, but let me fast forward to another time God parted the water. It's when they actually cross into the promised land when the Jordan River is flooded. And now, again, the Lord gives them a solution, and he says, you have the priest carry the Ark of the Covenant out into the water. Now, they could have stood on that bank forever, and the water would have not parted. So we're pretty sure that they had to get in the water before the water parted. How far? I'm not for sure. Was it Ankle depth, was it knee deep? I, I, you know, I, I don't know the exact, really, depth. But you know what he's saying? Go forward. As you move forward, I'm going to do something here. Tell the people to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea, and I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them so I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all of his army, his chariots, his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, which uh, when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, let's start there, because he said this twice. You know, God doesn't repeat himself because he forgot what he said. I do that, God doesn't. So God is saying, and you may not believe this, and this, this is okay. The Egyptians are tied to demonic gods 
they're tied to demonic gods. You say, okay, where do demonic gods come from? They are fallen, created entities that were part of God's rule, his inner circle, if you will, um, led by Satan, Lucifer. And we know a huge part of those deities, uh, when I say deities, I'm talking about little g, not big g, have fallen. They have power. They have authority because God gave that to them. Um, and the Egyptians are tied up into that, much like most of the people around uh, that area. There is only one true living God. But there's a lot of little g gods that have power. If they did not have power, these people would not be worshiping them. I have another theory, and, and th you, you just throw this out, and you can forget it as you leave. Have you ever wondered why the Greeks had all of these stories of these gods and Titans and Hercules and Apollo and Zeus and all the stories about their strength and their power and whatever. I mean, did they just dream that up? Or were there fallen angels that had come to the earth that actually had amazed these civilizations and they worshiped them? thought just a thought so now the lord is saying i'm going to show the egyptians i am the true living god i have power over the egyptian gods and we talked about every plague that he gave is over some type of god that they believed uh, and he says i'm going to show that i will gain honor over pharaoh now why does he use pharaoh in this because the pharaohs thought they were a God. They were descendants of the gods. Verse 19. And the angel of God went, who went from before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night so the cloud that led them and the angel of God which uh, a lot of thoughts on who the angel of God is there but uh, the Hebrew word is the, the messenger of Jehovah uh, went behind the Israelites and it, it parked between Israel and Egypt same cloud Light to one side, darkness to the other side. Light to one side, darkness to the other side. So it says it, it, it gave light by night so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all night. Everybody say night. Night appears about two or three times here. And made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea. So Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, uh, all the Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and his horsemen. So verse 24, and it came to pass in the morning. So it appears that they may have started their journey across the sea very, very early in the morning. Not only does the Lord part the waters, but he dries out the land. Now let me tell you, if this land has been at the bottom of the ocean uh, since close to creation, how many of you think it might be a little soggy, a little muddy, uh, maybe a little wet? But they went over what on dry ground. Here's something interesting. How many of you believe the Lord's parted the water for you many times so you can get through it? And, and here's the good news. You don't leave those old footprints behind you. You just keep going on. Just keep going on. 
So they cross over, we think, somewhere around maybe three million people. So if it was about an eight-mile journey and there were three million people, they've estimated it might have taken about four to eight hours for that many people to go that distance. So somewhere in the morning, that cloud lifted, went back in front of Israel to guide them through. And now Pharaoh and his army, his horses, his chariots, they're going to pursue. Verse 24, now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. That word means he confused them. And he took off their chariot wheels, so they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So no, not only did Israel know the Lord was fighting for them, uh, the Egyptians came to realize the Lord was fighting for them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariots, on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. When the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So let's stop right there. Now let's go back to what I said. How much water may have been walled up on each side? It wasn't 10 foot, wasn't 12 foot, wasn't 20 foot. It might have been a half a mile or a mile on both sides. The psalmist said the Lord congealed the waters. So as they passed through, the waters, I'm sure, were just quivering. I wondered if you and I were passing through that, you might have had the thought, this could come down any moment. Would you have had that thought? I probably would have. This, this could come down any moment. But it appears the Lord's holding this up just for us to get through. And of course, Pharaoh and the army, the horsemen, the, the chariots, they're pursuing. And somewhere, when Israel gets on the other side, they're still in the bottom of the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aqaba, um, um, whatever your preference is there. Um, the Bible says the Lord had Moses stretch his rod out again and he released the water so we were talking this afternoon and I, I need somebody who's an engineer or somebody who's really smart if, if there was a half a mile of water on each side of them how much pressure would that have been what does water weigh a little over 8 pounds a gallon is that right I think that's right. If there's a half a mile of water coming down on you from both sides, I wonder what kind of pressure that is on you. Buddy, you need to figure that out. You're an engineer. You and Benton, y'all figure out those numbers. But that's a lot of pressure, isn't it? And as Dr. Jeff has shown videos, you know, they have actually gone to some of these areas, and guess what they find in the bottom of the sea? They actually find chariot wheels there still there encrusted by the sea so you know I, I think that's pretty uh, amazing isn't it so the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea then the waters returned covered the chariots the horsemen all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them not so much as one of them remained but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left Verse 30, so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the, Lord, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Isn't it funny how quickly they turned around about their opinion of Moses because on one side of the sea you brought us out here to kill us on the other side you're a pretty good guy Moses <laughs> now we don't know exactly what Pharaoh this is but there has been some studies that have believed that there are certain Pharaohs that may fall into this uh, you know this scenario and 
We don't know if Pharaoh was in the bottom of the sea with them. We assume possibly he was. But the Bible does not say he led the army there. Was he on, on the, the, the bank, you know, telling his army to go across? Was he leading the army? It, it appears that maybe he perished there in that sea. And the entire army, they all perished together. So, uh, here's the, the difficulty with the Egyptians. From the ten plagues, they're in real trouble. Agreed? If Pharaoh perished there, now they have no leader. And his son died in the last plague. There's no heir. So some scholars and historians say there was a time where Israel, I mean, for Egypt was really compromised. And we think that it's because Pharaoh was destroyed. He has no heir because his oldest son has died. And the land has been decimated by the plagues, so now they're having to rebuild their dynasty because of the uh, Israeli uh, exodus. Um, so anyway, it's very interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. And one of the things I think that stand out for me, we, we've heard the story, I've taught on the story, I've read the story, but when you really get down and begin to dig about some of the, the areas, the the, 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 the gulfs or the oceans they, they crossed, and, and then you really look up the numbers. It is actually more interesting sometimes than what we really think. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, in my mind, I guess, you know, you, in Sunday school, you think the water's 20 foot high and it comes down and they're out there treading water. It could be they never got to the top until they floated up dead and then washed to the seashore because of the power of that cascading water that came upon them in the depths that they, they could have been. So 